Even if the stars refuse to shine Even if you think you're running out of time Even if the moon is not so bright Count on me to be your light You have a fire inside So go chase your dreams You don't even realize What that means Just know that you have What it takes to achieve in me the sky is blue Faith in me. 
Hey, how's it going, everybody? I'm Ben from Universal Audio, and welcome back to yet another episode of Office Hours. We're up to, I believe today is number 95, closing in on 100. We'll be there soon enough. That's at like four more weeks. Uh, but today we've got a really fu fun show for you guys. Uh, this has been a highly requested one for quite a while, talking about virtual channels. Uh, and you know, by talking about virtual channels, we're obviously going to talk a lot about the IO matrix uh, and kind of how to set this up to accomplish a lot of awesome things that you can do with your Apollo, with console, with Luna. Uh, we're going to geek out about it all day today. Uh, but yet again, guys, so good to see so many familiar names and faces here in the chat. Uh, and also, you guys, the music and the photos and the intro, like it's it's quickly it's quickly becoming my favorite part of the show is is hearing what you guys are doing. Uh, so if you guys are making music using Apollo, using Luna, using UAD, and you want us to feature it, uh, you know, hit us up live at uaudio.com is where to send your music. Hashtag Universal Audio over on Instagram or Facebook to have their photos show up. Uh, we really love featuring content that's created by you guys on there. And uh, yeah, with that, let me let me bring on my friends Drew and Matt to help us walk through virtual channels, IO matrixes, all all the fun geeky stuff, all uh, that fun stuff, all, all the good the, stuff, all the good stuff. <laughs> Well, and the, and the best part is if uh, if we if we do this if we stick to our script if we get through this, there's a little a little cherry on top at the end where uh, we're gonna continue our deep dive into different channel strips. We've covered the SSL, we've covered the Neve 88 RS, and today what uh, what do we have on deck, Drew? So we're gonna tell them. We're gonna tell them, or are we gonna? I, I think let's tease them now. Let's tease them now, so that way they you know they hang out with us throughout it, the whole thing. So 
Yeah, we got it. It's it's this is a really great one, and I got a good demo for you, so you're really gonna get your ears on it too. And it's the uh, the Van- the Manly Vox Box, uh, which is yes. one that's there's a lot of mystery great. behind this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's but it's it, there's just so much to it, so definitely stay tuned for that for sure. Oh yeah, uh, Drew, can you bring up your mic like 3 dB for me? I think uh, yeah, Matt and I are drowning sure. out just a touch. Oh, okay. uh, so uh, you know, before I forget, there's a couple of great promotions going on. If you guys don't already know, uh, the UAD store is on, in the custom shop mode right now, so you guys can get inc- incredible deals on UAD and Luna plugins and extensions. Uh, there's also the desktop platinum vocal promo. If you buy a twin or a solo, uh, you will get a, a bunch of awesome free plugins along with that device. Uh, so if, you, if you've been on the fence thinking about getting one, now's the time to do it because you get a lot of awesome bonus plugins along with that and uh yeah i think that's all for for my announcement stuff uh so guys we're gonna be talking a lot about virtual channels so if you guys are in the chat if you guys are already using virtual channels for stuff i'd love to hear what you guys are using it for and uh and and then obviously our plan our hope is to walk you guys through how they work how to set them up and a bunch of different and awesome uses for them uh but it'd be great to hear from you guys as well what you guys are finding useful for virtual channels and uh maybe we'll we'll call some out if you guys have got some uh some that we forgot or didn't know about uh so start us off guys what Matt, Drew, what, what exactly are virtual channels? How, how, what's the best play? What's the best way for people to think about these conceptually? Yeah, I mean they're basically Matt, in the box. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, they're basically like in the box inputs and outputs that you can use to send audio from one application to another. Um, you can use it just to send audio from an application out through the Apollo's DSP and then back into that same application. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, you can think of them just as the same as like an analog or digital input or output, but it's all inside of the box, all inside of the Apollo's uh, mixer engine and just for inner app communication. Nice. Well, and, and like the, the cool thing about the way virtual channels work too, right, is that you can process them with UAD plugins in real time, just like you would, you know, plug in a guitar or a microphone in, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, once you send audio into a virtual channel, it's all happening inside of the Apollo's DSP. Um, so just like the way you can plug a microphone in and then put a plug in on the input channel and console, you can do the same thing with virtual channels. So you can send, you know, from your DAW into the virtual channels, you can put plugins there. You can send system sound, you know, iTunes, Spotify, whatever you're listening to through the virtual channels and put a limiter on it or other processing. Um, so yeah, it's, it has all the great benefits of the normal analog and digital inputs on your Apollo um, just with the being able to send to it from an application instead of uh, I've seen users, input. yeah, I've seen users putting like their the output of their like home like their TV, you know, just like just oh, like yeah. routing your TV and putting the Fairchild on it, you know. It's like because movies can be really dynamic, you know. If you're watching a movie late at night, you know, like put a Fairchild on it with that nice long release time, and and uh, it'll smooth out the the movie for you. I've seen nice. people doing that. Uh, and you guys may be noticing on screen, uh, there's a new th- new feature in our, our software that lets me highlight some of your guys' comments. So I was, I was bringing a few of those up. Like Daniel mentioned uh, making the whole entire internet sound better by passing through <laughs> UAD plugins, sampling yeah. from iTunes. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of great uses for it. Uh, and we're going to walk through a bunch of these. And probably top of the list, I'm surprised no one said this one quite yet, uh, using it for Zoom calls. <laughs> this has been like the, yeah. one of the biggest, uh, even people inside UA, they're, they're constantly asking us, uh, you know, how do I, how do I, what's the best way to set up a microphone so I can, you know, sound like you guys on, on Zoom calls. And uh, <laughs> we've shown it a couple times, you know, as you guys know, uh, we're big fans of the software Loopback by Rogue Amoeba, and we've, we've highlighted this a few times when we've talked about our live stream setups here, because uh, it, cre- it creates a, a flexible way of doing a similar thing to virtual channels, but allows us to you know, bring together multiple channels, and, uh, but it's not free software. What we're going to show you guys today is we're actually, we'll talk about the Zoom setup without having to use Loopback. We'll just be able to use uh, just console and your uh, Universal Audio Thunderbolt driver inside the box. Um, so yeah, uh, another one, a uh, couple other ones that we thought of, like dedicated click track routing in the DAW. Uh, Drew's got this incredible trick. If you guys are tracking in other DAWs besides Luna for being able to uh, preserve vocal effects between your recorded tracks and your overdub track and being able to share processing between those using virtual channels. Um, and then there was a, a cool blog article that we just published recently too with uh, Vic Weinstein, uh, who's Tyler, the creator's engineer, we talked about how they bounced all of their stems out of Logic 
through virtual channels, through plugins, and then into Pro Tools to match the sound of the analog consoles that they're working on in the studios. Uh, so we're going to talk about all of these different workflows uh, throughout uh, the show today. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the good things to really think about and kind of know, you know, this is one of the things that just kind of understand how this works up top is latency when it comes to virtual channels. Essentially, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, there, there's, it's, it stays real time just like an analog one would, but there's kind of a, there's a, a delay compensation thing that you got to be careful of and mindful of when you are recording from one place to another, correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, the virtual channels are they, they're handled behind the scenes a little bit differently than like your analog or your digital channels. Um, so any anything real time, you're trying to play a virtual instrument in real time or something like that, they work great for. Mm -hmm. um, anytime you go to record what's in the virtual channels to another application, the delay compensation can get a little wonky. Um, usually things will print ahead of time. Uh, mm -hmm. So just be aware that if you are printing from one application to another, you're probably going to have to manually nudge things into place. Um, but yeah, for real time, everything's perfectly in time um, with no added latency. So th it's great for that application. Nice. Yeah. So the kind of thing about it, it's a great for a one way trip, doing round trips or doing, you know, things that need to be synchronized together. That's, that's the only ch places where you may get caught up a little bit. Um, but for normal real time operation, like what we're going to show you guys today, uh, virtual channels are a great, a great way to do this. Um, so let's, uh, I guess without further ado, let's let's dive in to some settings. This is so exciting, right, guys? We're gonna talk about <laughs> settings. Um, so let me let me share my screen here because essentially a lot of this is happening, and uh, I'll show you guys. Let me actually we're gonna do a lot of today. We're gonna do a lot of this in console. So let me uh, let me share my screen. Uh, we're gonna do a lot of this in console, so that way it is. Uh, it's going to be relevant to you guys whether you're using Luna or not. The good, the one thing to know is that all of these settings are automatically transferred from one place to another. So whether you uh, you you know you're tweaking your I/O settings in Luna or console, doesn't matter. You're going to get the same results, uh, and the settings automatically carry over from one to another. Uh, but a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today, this is also useful for you know people working in Pro Tools or Logic or Live um, as well. So. Let me bring up my settings window here. Let's go over to the hardware tab. So this is the one of the first settings that you got to know about, and Matt's got an awesome video about this, is the channel DSP pairs. There's a slider inside for each one of your Apollos. You can allocate how many DSP pairs you have or how many virtual channels you have. Uh, and Matt, the, I guess the reason why they, they have this option, right, is you – essentially using the same resources inside of your Apollo to either create DSP pairs or have virtual channels available, correct? Yeah, exactly. I mean, DSP pairing is basically using the virtual channels um, to link together uh, basically two channels behind the scenes in console. So you have the uh, the power of two channels. Um, so yeah, that's why when you enable DSP pairs, you're losing those virtual channels because behind those scenes, or behind the scenes, the virtual channels are actually being used to process the um, additional plugins that you load on that track. Mm -hmm. And so, and by default, I, I think I've got mine in the default settings, right? They kind of ship in the yeah, middle. Yeah, it's in the middle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so this is this and just is, so everybody it, knows. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but the, these are they're per device and they're stored with the session. So okay. you can literally you can literally have console sessions that are earmarked towards DSP pairs or towards virtuals, and then recall them. And these settings will be recalled with that per device per session. Nice. And uh, and those sessions, the sessions you're talking about there, Drew, is that Luna sessions or just the console sessions? No, it's console sessions. And that's mm -hmm. actually an important distinction, Ben, because one thing that you, everybody should know about Luna is that Luna will uh, create its, a new session based on uh, whatever your last stored session is mm -hmm. uh, in console. When I say session, I mean console session. And then when you quit Luna, it puts it back. So it's gotcha. always a good idea, even if you're not using console specifically, it's always a good idea to sort of have your base console session that you use that has things like DSP pairing, that has maybe your channel strips named and so forth, um, mm -hmm. and then have that stored and saved. So that way, when you when you launch Luna, Luna will uh, use that as sort of its foundation for the, for the next session, and then it'll put it back when it's done. 
Nice. And Drew Bain, you brought up such a good point because that's a big thing we're going to show you guys today is like, there's, you know, it's fine to leave things on default, guys, but really where a lot of power is for both your IO and your console sessions and, you know, as Drew just mentioned, how this flows into Luna as well is saving yourself some sessions. Even if it's like, I, I think I honestly maybe use one, but it's my default one. So that way, anytime I pull up console, all my tracks are named with the inputs that I have them normal to. Uh, but you know, we've shown this, I think, uh, you know, with some of the template stuff, you know, you guys, you can have like a, a drum tracking session, right? So that you can pull up console and just have all your, all your mic inputs and your gains and everything kind of preset for tracking a certain scenario. Uh, and you can have like a guitar overdub one. You can create as many of these sessions as you want and in store settings, you know, whether it's your unison plugins, your record effects, your headphone, your cue sends and reverbs, like, uh, this is it's like a fully recallable console and there's so many great uses for this so definitely don't sleep on saving sessions but along with that we have the io matrix this is where this is where we're going to geek out a lot today this is another great place to go ahead and customize and save uh an io setup that makes sense and and works for your workflow um you know mine as you can as you guys can see is highly customized like i'm going from one device to another device because these are the the order of inputs that I want to have presented in Luna and other DAWs. Uh, but you can save these presets as well as uh, so you can make multiple ones. So you know, if you, again, you have like a tracking one, maybe you have a Zoom call one, <laughs> um, and we'll 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 geek out a little bit about these. But the real kind of this was a, a eye opening thing that uh, Drew and Matt were helping me to last week is that the way I think about the IO matrix, this is what your Apollo reports to system audio, to core audio, correct? Like whatever you have typed in here and however many inputs and outputs you have listed, this is what core audio thinks is available on your Apollo. Yeah, a lot of people a lot of people seem to think that or I've seen people think online where they feel like the IO matrix is configuring their Apollo system itself. Whereas what it's actually doing is it's you're configuring what inputs and outputs are reported to core audio and therefore uh, reported and available to other apps. So it's, mm -hmm. it's meantime in console, every bit of your IO is available at all times. This just constrains it or customizes it to sort of send it off to the rest of the world, so to speak, inside of your computer. Totally. And so that's yeah. exactly what you guys can see here. See like how I'm going from, you know, one through six or, you know, my AES and a couple of lines and then I jump over to the X8. But in console, it's still, it's, you know, each device is in all the inputs for the devices are available inside a console here for me. And they're, you know, they don't necessarily echo the same order. So uh, this is a trick, this is a, a really important tip that's gonna come in handy a little bit later when we're talking about, um, you know, doing broadcast shows, uh, doing say like a Zoom live stream or something where you wanna have multiple tracks and effects and everything you want to have that going to air. Uh, we're gonna show you a trick where you can have console, be using a console to do one thing, but have your IO matrix reporting another thing. Uh, in order to get a great broadcast uh, set up. Uh, so yeah, save your IOs, guys. Uh, and notice what I do is like, I'll save iterations of mine. Um, you know, so I, I've got the Ben IO. Uh, there's one back from October and then the most recent update, which was uh, right at the end of the year of December. So I like to keep, I like to keep them around for a while, you know, uh, in case I ever need to get back. Uh, there's like an OBS configuration from uh, our old Zoom and... Uh, uh, OBS config, and then there's a bunch of def all these single Apollo ones. These are all kind of the uh, default presets that are installed with your UAD driver. Um, but yeah, highly recommend getting in there and setting those up. Um, yeah, and, and Ben, you mentioned that um, you know the IO matrix on Mac is how the Apollo reports its inputs and outputs to core audio. Um, if you're on a Windows machine, the IO matrix is basically how the Apollo um, reports its inputs and outputs to any ASIO device. That'd be like, or ASIO application, so any kind of DAW application. Mm -hmm. um, but be aware that uh, on if you are in Windows, any kind of changes that you make to the IO matrix, that doesn't affect how Windows system sound works because Windows has two different driver types for that. Um, so yeah, if, if you are in Windows, just this is just for uh, ASIO applications. Nice. Matt, Matt's our resident Windows expert. So, yeah. Thank He'll, goodness. <laughs> thank God. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll keep on. We'll, uh, as many of these tips as we can, we'll make sure they translate both for, uh, we'll distinguish which ones are Mac only and which ones uh, also apply over to Windows. So, it's important to know. 
Well, yeah, and I guess if you're not seeing the IO matrix, then you know you're on a, a, an Apollo Firewire or you're on a USB, you know, twin USB and so forth. They use a driver table that is, you can check the manual, check the hardware manual that came with your device, and there's a driver table in there. So it's not customizable, but you still can see all of these uh, inputs and outputs in that driver table. Nice. Um, all right, so we're, we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff here in the IO. Uh, so let me make sure. Yeah, so IO settings, guys. This is my saved one, but let me let's let's kind of back up a bit. And this is this is a really handy thing for when you're first creating your uh, first creating an I/O setup, or there's been there's been some weird edge cases. Every once in a while, if you're getting something, if something's being really weird uh, with your Apollo output, say like you're you can see the meters going, but you're not hearing anything, or uh, you're just getting weird glitches or whatnot. There's there's a few cases where going from a custom I/O back to a default I/O solves the problem. Uh, plus, it also just gives you a blank slate. So, uh, luckily today, I'm gonna and typically, you know, if we were doing this with loopbacks and and broadcasting on the same machine, uh, this is this would this is gonna cause a lot of resets. But uh, luckily, what you guys are hearing is on a separate Apollo today. So I'm gonna go default. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wipe out my auto or my customized I/O. And now the IO matrix is rebuilt using its default settings. And it and that's is everything, like literally everything. every input and output of every device. Right. It, and so you can see, yep, there's all my virtuals, cues, aux, talkbacks, monitor, and it just, it stacks them up as tightly as it can. So you can see I, I jumped up to 78 inputs and 70 outputs. You know, I've got a multi-system here with a X16, an X8, and a twin. So this will scale up and down depending on how many Apollos you have. Uh, but there's a bunch of things that we wanted to point out about when you do a default like this. Hey, so, Ben, what does the gray inputs mean? What, what does it mean when they're gray? <laughs> what does it, it means that they are not, they're not active. Uh, <laughs> so remember, you guys, how we were over here in our hardware, we were you know, toggling between our virtual channels and our DSP pairs. So for my X16, I have four virtual channels available. And you'll notice X16, virtual one through four are white, but five through eight are kind of grayed out right here. Uh, that's because they're currently and they're not active. Uh, they're not they're not available for me to use. But the IO matrix has kind of saved their space. So this way, you know, if I wanted to, I can come back and say, you know what, I don't need DSP pairs today. I need more virtual channels. Now they go from gray to white. Uh, so this gives you that flexibility to uh, to grow into a system. And you can also notice like my AES EBU is is grayed out. Well, that's because I have a digital mirror turned on right now. So whatever's going out to my mon left, right analog outputs is being uh, sent to the AES EBU output of my X16. So it's not available to be addressed directly because you know I'm getting there by using my mon left, right. Uh, so yeah, when you default, you get all of your inputs, all of your outputs, all showing up there. Uh, I guess there's there's a few other cases right where you get grade in the, in and outs uh, like the talkback. Yeah, the talkback on my a X16. Twin present. Yeah, mm -hmm. whenever a twin's present, it automatically takes on that monitor controller slash talkback role, and therefore, you know, only one device needs to be that. You wouldn't want all of the talkback mics coming on at once or, or being available. They're not even available, so yeah, they just uh, uh they just kind of go go silent. Go yep, away. and same with my Q outputs. You know, I'm, I've I've set up my system for uh, you know, I've told it I want two Q mixes, and again, this is an option that you would come into hardware. Tell it how many Q buses you want. So it, 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 it's all making sense. This is pretty, you know, pretty cut and dry, right? This is fairly logical why some things are grayed out, why they're not. It's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that something's broken. It just means that they're not available, uh, but your IO is, is still there to account for it. Um, yeah. So this is, you know, this is kind of where you start. But a good thing, a, a really good practice, you know, if you are going to kind of default it and then you want to start kind of customizing it. This is this is where the cascade button is going to be your best friend, <laughs> uh, and this is this is one of the one of the buttons that to a lot of people, uh, even myself, uh, I typically kind of forget how it works, and then I I bug Matt to remind me how how to use it. <laughs> um, but it's an incredibly useful tool. So let's say uh, I'm going to do a, a for example here. Um, you know, if I was working the way I used to work in Pro Tools was using hardware inserts, right? So I'd want to go outline one two back in line one, two. And in Pro Tools, you want these to be right across from each other. But as you can notice, like mon left, right, they're taking up my one, two, and, and my line ins and outs are offset. 
guys, this is it's so easy to, to switch this up that uh, when you do it this way uh, with the cascade. So the trick here is to set your first, set where you want to start. And essentially, what cascade does is it allows you to say, "Cool, starting at line one, hit the cascade button, select the channel you want to start on, and then drag down from there." And notice as I keep on dragging, it's overwriting. And it's allowing me to address each one of those outputs and it re, uh, you know, reworks them. And then I can scroll down, click, click, just like that. Now I've gone 15, 16. Um, so this, it's a really quick way to you know, say, hey, start here. And then you know what? Keep on flowing with the inputs or the outputs from this one to this one to this one. Um, and and you know, especially if you're going to reconfigure a bunch of channels all at once, that's a, a great way to do it. Um, and then we also, you know, there's some shortcuts to this, guys. Uh, so if you if you're in a multi-system thing like this, or uh, you just kind of you want to work quickly, and you, you're a keyboard shortcut fiend like I am, uh, notice this orange outline. This allows me. I'm using the arrow keys right now, so I'm going left and right through here, and I can go up and down to select different uh, different options. I can go up and down you know, through each box, I can select different units. I can even select none this way. Uh, so say you wanted to make a bunch of tracks all set to none, you can, you know, add the command key to that. So command down allows you to step through your different inputs and outputs. So I can go command down and then up arrow to select none. Command down, up arrow to select none. Just like this. So there's... Uh, Having done this the click, click, click way, uh, I can tell you that doing it the keyboard shortcut way is, <laughs> is actually really, really handy. Um, and it, it's actually, that's a newly discovered trick for me as of like literally this morning. <laughs> yeah. we, uh, hey, this Larry, uh, Larry was asking in the chat a, a Luna specific question about whether or not when you create a template, uh, will the matrix be is stored with it? The, the, the short answer is that Luna sessions do not contain IO matrixes in them, and therefore they'll, which is good, you, because that means that they're not tied to them. And so a Luna session will open regardless of what the IO matrix looked like when you got it. It might show you, it might tell you, hey, some ins and outs aren't available, but it, it they'll adapt and will open no matter what. So uh, there's no no concern there. You can always your sessions will always adapt to any IO matrix changes that you might have made. Mm -hmm. And as you guys can see here, my Luna, um, I went to my Luna settings to the IO matrix. So you can see all these uh, very un unhelpful changes I've been making to my IO setup have all carried over into Luna automatically, um, which is great. So this is, uh, Matt, there's a, let's drop a couple of links here, I guess, in the chat. With some, there's a, a great getting started with the IO matrix uh, knowledge base article that, uh, mm -hmm. that you guys should definitely have on hand. Uh, you know, obviously you can come back and watch this episode to hear us chit chat about it a bunch, but, uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of uh, great resources on help.uaudio.com. If you guys are trying to do this on your own later, uh, one really important thing to know about using Luna with your IO matrix, and you, you may see this, especially if you go into, uh, the next part that we're going to be talking about here, which is your, your audio MIDI setup. And this is, it's obviously a Mac uh, a very much a Mac thing. You can notice here that I've got, you know, again, I, uh, audio MIDI setup is reading what my IO matrix is reporting. So currently a lot of nuns, and then we get line 11, 12. Um, but since I have Luna open, there's going to be something else that feels a little bit weird in here. These reserved one, two, you know, so right now my IO matrix ends at, you know, C virtual four. You can see that over here, but then there's all these reserved ones. Uh, so yeah, Drew, Matt, what, what are, what are these reserve tracks and, and what are they doing there? And, and what, what do people need to be mindful of when they're using a, say a, like a larger Apollo system with, uh, with yeah. all this? Yeah. That's so, you know, so Luna does use core audio through, you know, use the IO from the, from core audio and what it does in order to make sure that there's enough, you know, sort of IO headroom available for it, for all of the arm stuff. Like, so we've, we've talked a lot about arm. This is a whole bunch of, you know, uh, fancy stuff going on in the background that ensures that you've always got, you know, a path, a live path for your mic and a, and a return path for a disc playback. And so there's a lot going on there. And what Luna does when it launches is it takes your IO matrix and it, and it will report that to core audio, but it also needs, it also wants a, some headroom there with uh, available uh, slots, core audio slots that it might need uh, depending on what you're doing while the, while Luna is open. So those are, those are reserved for that. And that way they can't be sort of taken by another app 
um, that might that is also using core audio. Um, and there is a limitation to that, Matt. You wanna you wanna cover that? The uh, I guess it's is it a core? I guess it's a core audio limitation. I suppose it's so it's a it's kind of a yeah. a limit, right? Yeah. It's basically, core audio has a limitation of 128 channels. Anytime you go above that, you can get some wonkiness. Um, so what that means is since Luna's adding all these reserve channels in the background, you basically want to make sure that your actual IO that you see in IO matrix and console is limited. Um, especially on a multi-unit system, uh, it's best to make sure that it's limited to 64 channels or lower. That way, when you open Luna and Luna adds all its reserve channels, it still doesn't put it over that 128 limit. Mm -hmm. um, Cause basically even though, you know, IO matrix and console might be showing you less than 128. Once Luna adds those reserve channels, it can put you over and then get you into that, that wonky state. Yeah, and this really um, so only yeah. impacts, yeah, it really only impacts people what we're, you know, probably three, you know, X, X16s, X8s, X, you know, multiple X8s, like people with potentially three to four Apollos that have a lot of IO, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just posted a link in the chat that um, goes over that IO limit, how to work around it, uh, and kind of best practices for avoiding any problems with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's super easy. You know, you can come up here, you can specify in your IO matrix, you can say, you know what, man, just uh, 64 and 64. Uh, it's a really great way, as you can see, it just truncates, you know, all the inputs that I had beyond that. Uh, and then, of course, I would come up here and get rid of all these gray ones by cascading and, and working around there. Um, but, you know, let me put it back here to default. Because luckily I'm not, I'm right at the edge. I'm at 112 channels reported with uh, with Luna open. So I'm not going to get any of that wonkiness right now. Uh, so this is this is the thing. This is the thing I think a lot of people are, are, are wanting to know, which is putting these virtual channels to use, right? So uh, enough about this IO matrix. That's that's this is boring. <laughs> What's fun is is using virtual channels for uh, for fun here. So by default, uh, and this is a we'll talk Mac here, but uh, Matt will shout out how we do this in Windows. In Mac, you open up Audio MIDI Setup. Uh, it's in your Utilities folder. Or if you're like me, I just use Spotlight to pull it up. Audio MIDI Setup. And then under Audio Devices, you select Universal Audio Thunderbolt. This, this is how you get connected to all of your uh, ins and outs for your Apollos. You can see I've got inputs, I've got outputs. The key button right here. Now let's say say you're like Danielle and you want to listen to you want your system audio to always be going through your virtual channels. This is really helpful for if you want to monitor what you're listening to on the internet and process it with some UAD. Uh, you know, if you want to master everything that you're listening to in a way, or uh, you know, for sampling from iTunes or other places. Um, if you you know, essentially, if you want to send audio from your system out through virtual channels instead of your monitors, you're going to click configure speakers. And then here's where you can tell it, all right, I've got stereo, stereo output, just like it is. And then instead of going mon left, right, I want to go to virtual one and virtual two. And of course, if you name, instead of naming it virtual one and virtual two in your IO matrix, name it OS left, OS right. And then those changes will get reported to core audio and you'll not be hunting for it and having to remember which ones they are. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I love how fast this stuff updates. Notice I, I changed an IO matrix. When I bring back this window, you can see it's now labeled OS left, right. Um, so yeah, na guys, naming things, it's it's uh, highly underrated because it is, it is such an important thing to keep track of what you're using things for. Um, yeah. So now now my system audio, when I set you know my system output, uh, my face is covering this up. Let me see if I try zooming in up here. There we go. Uh, you guys know where I'm trying to click, right? So it's it's the little <laughs> speaker icon in the top of your menu bar. Select universal audio as your output. Uh, and now, instead of going out my monitor left to right, I'm now coming in virtual channel one, two on my, on my system. Um, so Matt, uh, for Windows people, is there a way for them to use virtual one, two as their output, just like we're showing the Mac folks? Yeah, so if you're on Thunderbolt on Windows, there is a way. Um, if you're on FireWire or USB on Windows where you can't reassign the IO matrix, um, there's unfortunately no way to change it. System sound will always go to monitor left and right. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're on Windows, so basically there, there's a Windows uh, called the Sound Control Panel, um, which is pretty much the equivalent of Audio MIDI setup on Mac. But you can't actually select specific channels to route to. Um, the sound control panel will just always send to output one and two of your audio device. So the workaround on Windows Thunderbolt would be to go into the IO matrix and console, um, set the first two inputs on the output, sorry, the first two outputs rather, um, mm -hmm. to whatever outputs you want system sound to go to. So in this case, virtual one and two. 
and then uh, Windows will always send to those first two channels. So you can basically assign that wherever you want system sound to go, and that's where it'll end up. Nice. That's also but, a good tip for anything that's that is only capable of getting the first two uh, outputs of your driver. So if you put if you make the first two outputs, you know, some things like OBS where without pre without any configuration or other software, it'll just take the first two by default. You can make it take whatever those two are by assigning that. Hopefully that makes sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Does that make? Yep. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, all right, so let me get again. Let me go back to default here. Um, so. That's how you get system audio, we'll, and we're gonna, we'll put this all into practice here in a minute. Uh, but I know, you know, as I teased, one of the one of the biggest uses for uh, for the Apollo, all of us want a great sounding Zoom experience. For, since we're all still all still working remotely and and uh, you know hanging out with folks over Zoom calls and FaceTimes, etc. So you know, let me we're gonna basically walk you guys through walk you through two different scenarios for setting up console with Zoom. So that way you can, in real time, uh, kind of process your vocals for folks on the other end of your calls. Uh, so I'm in a default IO matrix right now. You know, nothing, nothing fancy, nothing special. Um, I've got a, I've got my console open here. I've got a channel already labeled. It's called Ben mic. And that's this uh, little second, secondary mic I got hanging out right here. Um, so, you know, let me just, uh, let's keep it simple. You know what? Let's, let's bring up the uh, the plugin of the day. Why not? Give it a bunch of gain. Because it's SM7. It loves more gain. Maybe a little bit of output gain. There it is. Now my meter's going good. You guys are still, you guys are going to be hearing my good mic. Not this one, but for demonstration purposes. So now I've now got my, my track here. It's, uh, I'm going to leave it muted in here this this is kind of the important thing and a lot of people when they set this up with zoom they're like like people are hearing me but like it sounds phasey or weird and this is this is a thing about how zoom captures audio from you so i'm going to open up my settings here and change my microphone from my webcam to thunderbolt and i'm going to change my speaker to same as system so with my system you know if i come back here configure speakers Virtual three and four, because uh, that's the one I have set up inside a console. What you're going to notice is in Zoom. Uh, let me let me mute mute this guy. That's going to come in to come into focus later. Nope, that's not working. Uh, da, da, da. Leave this here. Boom. There we go. Uh, so now. Console, audio media setup, zoom. All right, so now I'm my microphone is coming out. Uh, sorry, it's not going anywhere because it's. I'm going to mute it here. the The thing that you guys run into, if you're getting phasey or comb filtery, uh, zoom picks up all of the inputs. So everything, everything in my IO matrix, all of these inputs are getting reported to zoom. Uh, so this is a blessing and a curse, right guys? Like this is a, uh, (laughs) so this means anything in my studio could be sending signal and probably by looks of it, something in my studio is sending signal into my zoom as well as my microphone. Uh, and this includes monitor left, right. So if I have this unmuted here in console, you can see it's now it's hitting the speakers. I'm, I'm hitting this output meter. People in zoom are going to be hearing me twice. I'm going to sound filtery comb filtery kind of weird uh so the key here is to mute yourself on the channel and then you're going to want to come in and use like a cue use a headphone cue to be able to send you know if you want to hear yourself a little bit which is it's very helpful so you're not shouting at people uh it's it's always good it's good to hear the more you hear yourself the less likely you are going to be shouting on the call because you can't hear yourself well enough so use and a this cue. is exactly what we're doing, right? This is mm-hmm. exactly what we're doing, Ben. Yep. And this, this by by we, this is how we hear ourselves without sending ourselves t- doubly to back to you. Exactly. Or, you know, without sending yourself back. Yeah. So this is this is why it's important to. So I'm going to use Q1 to hear myself, and then as you guys saw, I was setting up, uh, you know, virtual three four, which is what I call virtual Q, and or sorry, it's virtual one two on here. I messed that up, but uh, virtual Q. So now when I send with my configure speakers, oops, one and two, 
now the audio that I get back from folks via Zoom or just anywhere on my system is coming through this channel. Again, leave it muted. This is the other big thing that we uh, – don't worry, guys. If you if you run into this, like we run into this literally every day. We just have enough – we've done this enough times that we know where to reach immediately to fix it. But again, you're going to want to make sure this is muted so it's not going to your monitor left, right. And then you're going to use the sends of your queue. You know, in my case, this is virtual one, two, and send that to Q1, which is my headphone output. So this way I can hear myself talk through the speakers. I can hear other folks on the other side of the Zoom call. Everything is now being mixed here inside of inside a console. So you know, I showed you guys adding a Unison plugin. You know, I can I can get crazy with this. I can add you know, I can throw a distressor on there. Um, and then you know, what's really helpful for receiving people's Zoom calls is to also use a distressor. Like, <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm just addicted to distressors. It's a very easy to use one, but you know, if you're having trouble hearing folks, reason. yeah, if you if you're having trouble hearing <laughs> folks on the call, uh, or you know, someone's mic is low, someone's mic is super loud. You know what, man? Just throw it on the, throw it on the nuke setting. No, I'm just joking. Uh, you know, <laughs> throw it on a reasonable <laughs> setting, and you can use this to to help level everybody out on your Zoom call. So I'm now monitoring my call through virtual one two into this track. Uh, through a distressor, I've got my voice getting processed by a Vox box into a distressor, and then that's what the other folks on the other side of the call are hearing. There's no echoing, there's no comb filteriness, and what's what's important, and I'm able to monitor myself and my call via the headphones uh, with these settings. So that's about is that's that's the basic easy way to do this. Oh, and one last thing I want to do uh, to show about this. Uh, is you'll notice under virtual queue, you'll notice there's a thing called isolate. And I should do this to my microphone as well. What isolate does, this is kind of an important uh, trick. If you're going to use this as your kind of your preset, your your you know, your default setting uh, for how you want console and how you want uh, all this audio to work, when you have it isolated, uh, Luna won't overwrite these settings. So when I open up a Luna session and I tell it to, you know, put uh use use this track mic one on my Apollo X eight, it will leave these settings intact. It'll it's kind of locking these in in a way. Uh, whereas if I leave this unisolated, Luna could take over and it would actually blank it out uh, these settings uh, in a new session. Uh, same with the same with the queue. So it's just important to come in here and isolate and then you know what, since you got some settings that you like, why not go over here and do a little save as uh, Ben Zoom Q. Awesome. Just like that. So now I can always get back to these settings inside a console uh, very, very easily. And I guess there is one there is one caveat there, Ben, isn't it right? Luna, if, you've, if you're down to like your, your last pair of virtuals, even if they're isolated, Luna might take them over for an instrument track. I'm not mistaken. Is that true, Matt? Is that I can't. I think that's true. Yeah. If you so, um, if all virtual channels are isolated or being used by other things, Luna will actually grab the uh, next available digital input. So if you have like eight ah, inputs okay. that aren't being used, it'll grab that. Um, if you have no digital channels and no virtual channel, or sorry, if you have no digital channels and all your virtual channels are isolated, Luna will try to grab the um, the last virtual channel in the list. Okay. Yeah, so. that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and that's to be aware. That it's something, yeah, something to be, and that's that's kind of what we were, we were mentioning earlier about how Luna Luna uses these virtual tracks and uses these in the box routing resources uh, for ARM mode when you're using virtual instruments. So just for regular audio or digital inputs and outputs, uh, you're not having to eat up any of those resources to monitor them in real time. But uh, for virtual instruments, that's where it's going to start using. Uh, and sometimes I think we've talked about this in other episodes where you may notice that your virtual channel has level coming through and you're like, wait, why is virtual seven, eight? Like, why is that getting used? Oh yeah. It's cause I have a mini Moog or I have an instrument active inside of Luna and that's where it takes. Um, see Patrick is asking if I don't use Luna, does isolate apply? Uh, I, I guess Luna, it'll, it'll isolate a channel from a console session recall. Mm. So if you recall a console session, isolated channels do not are protected nice so this way so i could go yeah. in here I, you know i could recall recall a different session uh you'll notice that ben mike and virtual queue will not change they're gonna they're gonna be saved from one session to another uh dean's asking yeah, does isolate console... that feature was yeah that feature was added because of luna but it happens to also work you know just in console in general so nice i see uh, dean's asking does console work with facetime as well 
Uh, and I believe so, right guys? Like essentially the same tricks that we just showed you guys for Zoom, FaceTime, as far as I know, picks up, you know, it's, it follows whatever the system is set to and does the exact same thing. Yeah, yep. yeah that's yeah, the nice I think thing I've about Mac. I mean, that, pretty, yeah. much, pretty much every application on Mac uses core audio. So all these tricks that we're showing you apply to pretty much any application on Mac. Mm hmm so I see uh, the obvious. So the Windows question here, Matt. Uh, how much of what we just showed, folks, can you do inside of Windows um, in terms of sending a mic to Zoom or doing any of this sort of stuff? Um, yeah. So if you're on, it, it will work uh, marginally. I mean, if you're on FireWire or USB, you can't like reassign the I/O. So um, you pretty much have to do what you just showed, where the, whatever is being sent to the monitor left and right outputs will be the mix that makes it into whatever application you're using, Zoom, Discord, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so you just have to manually mute the channels that you're actually using so they don't get sent twice through the actual input and through the monitor left and right. Um, but yeah, everything else, for the most part, applies. Nice. That's awesome. All right. So this is so this is the the Zoom meeting. You know, bookmark this, guys. Come back to it. Copy the setup. Uh, this this is the way to, to get a great sounding broadcast thing happening inside of Zoom without letting people echo and hear themselves or without you sounding comb filtery. Uh, just again, the real key to that is using the cues instead of uh, your monitor output. Does so yeah, and this configuration is more like your standard sort of Zoom, you know, where it's just voice, right? It's just mm -hmm. you on a call. You want to sound great. You want to hear every yourself, and you want to hear the call good. That's what this configuration is all about, right? Exactly. Sort of your standard Zoom setup. Yep. And so now, remember at the beginning of the show, we were talking about you know with the I/O matrix. We you know Drew mentioned. Well, you know, so you can have your IO matrix, this, this represents what your system sees, but you still have available to you all of your channels inside of console. So this is really, really helpful. Let's say you're doing uh, a live stream multi, you know, you've got a band, a live band set up, or, you're, you know, even you've got a guitar and vocal and a keyboard, you've got multiple inputs all happening and you want to add some reverb and delay and you want it to all go to the you know, person on the other side of your call or inside of OBS. Uh, without having to use any special loopback software, so this is gonna we're gonna take the exact opposite uh, kind of approach here. Where I'm gonna I'm gonna essentially what we're gonna do is instead of instead of letting those applications see all of my inputs, the, you know, seeing them all multi-track and seeing them all by themselves, I only want a great sounding two-track going to that source. So essentially, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get rid of all of our inputs except for monitor left and right. And then we're going to use console here to do all the mixing and processing uh, and end up with a great sounding stereo two track mix that can then be going into OBS to zoom to anywhere else. Uh, so for folks who are broadcasting stuff, uh, you know, we use this even inside of UA for uh, we get a little, a little happy hour uh, hangout that they do for folks. And this is the way that we will send the artists a, a twin or an X4 uh, with a laptop, and what we do is we we make a real simple I/O setup. Uh, I'm going to cut it down to eight just to make this really fast and easy. Essentially, what you're going to do is you're going to make the only inputs available. So the only thing that Zoom or OBS sees is monitor left or right, and then the rest of them. I'm using my keyboard shortcut trick: Command down, up arrow to select none. As you can see, if I go across, it selects the other ones, but Command down, up, command down, up, command down, up. So I've now I've now restricted my device to only see monitor left, right. So now zoom, if we go back into my zoom settings, you can see there's nothing presented. It's it's hearing nothing right now, as intended. So if I go over here in a console and unmute. Now, what's unmuted, whatever's hitting my speakers is now hitting Zoom. So I can have that and I can you know, set up aux one with a little bit of a plate. Let's go pure plate. So I'm now, again, unmute that. So I'm now sending my voice through a reverb into Zoom and then to get it in stereo, you know, uh, this is a little Zoom hack for you guys. Make sure you turn on the enable original sound option because this allows you to have high fidelity music mode as well as stereo audio. 
Um, they didn't have this at the beginning of the pandemic, I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> these options were not there, uh, which made it even hard uh, hard to listen to at some points. But uh, nowadays you can we have tried. Re- Yeah, we, we tried, guys. Trust me. That's why we had all these all those crazy workarounds that we talked about last year. But nowadays, uh, with the trick I just showed you guys, blasting out your, your inputs so you're just – Zoom can now only hear monitor left right. It can't. It won't hear my mic input directly. It's only going to hear whatever the result of this is. Um, so you can still do you can still do tricks for the performers, right? So the performers could still be listening to the cue. They could be hearing a customized mix. You know that they want to hear more of themselves or less of the the drummer, whatever whatever it is. You can still use the cues. Those are independent mixes. But now whatever is going out your mon left right to your speakers to your main out. That is now what's getting presented to Zoom, to OBS, to FaceTime, to to any other devices. Um, yeah, and this and it, is purely for live performance because because you've constricted those inputs to just mon left and right, right? So mm-hmm. therefore, all those all those beautiful sound all those inputs are not available to your DAW. Your DAW will only see mon left and right and Luna too. Just so you know, just so you know. Yep, yep. Yeah. So this, that's the one downside of, of this workflow. Uh, you know, and the, again, this is kind of why, like, for us, we end up using loopback because what loopback allowed us to do is allowed us to say, you know what, take the monitor left, right, what I just showed you guys, isolate those and create a special audio, a virtual audio device just created from those. Uh, so that's if you if you need to have multi track capabilities as well as a two track to go to air. That's where you're going to want to uh, check out something like Loopback, or there's a few competitors to that uh, nowadays I've seen come out. But um, the, yeah, this is the, the the quick and dirty, the easy way. If you're not trying to make a multi-track record, you're just trying to make a good sounding mix to go to air. This is how you can do that inside a console. You still get real time processing. You still get headphone cues. You get reverbs and delays. Uh, you kind of get everything that you need to be able to go to air with. Um, it's like an internet PA system, basically. Mm-hmm, totally. Yeah. So it's like, Turn it's a console like, into a live sound mixer, pretty much. Exactly. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's like it's like the Mackie board inside of your computer, right? Yep. <laughs> um, so yeah, hopefully, is this all? You know, I'm not uh, I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat, but hopefully, this is all making sense to you guys. <laughs> They're all going to rewatch it, Ben. Yeah. That's the okay. consensus. <laughs> They're the, going to rewatch. <laughs> the consensus is we're going to rewatch it all, which is great. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's see. Can we walk through loopback and another? Sure. Well, we can do that. Um, how did I delete everything else in my matrix? So the, the quick way I did it was, uh, I just trim, I used the output thing up here to trim it down to eight to make it really fast. It's the guys, the cascade thing works really, really great for cascading inputs, you know, from one to another to another. Uh, the one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't let you cascade none. It doesn't, <laughs> that's the one, uh, you know, hit the feedback button. Let it, let them let them know how much you guys. Are. It's, it's one of those things. Again, this is like a one and done, right? And what I would recommend you guys do is, if this is going to be a setup that you're going to use from time to time, guys, come in here, save yourself, save this as an IO preset, right? So I'm going to call this Ben Zoom Mon Left Right, so that easy easy for me to remember that. Hey, if I ever need to do this quickly, I can just pull up my Mon Left Right preset. Uh, to do, you know, to do a show or do a live thing real quick. And then what I can do is I can just click on, I can just load up my standard IO. Look at this guys. Now my, my system is back to the IO that I'm used to. Uh, and then I've got the rest of my system kind of preset for here. Um, so I love that you can save and recall these as you need. Uh, and there's no, you know, no real limit to how many different IOs you make. Uh, but if you make one that's useful to yourself, Save it. Save the console session. Save the I/O settings, uh, and you can always get back to where you are. Um, so now, let's talk. Let's talk about some more creative, some more musical. Yeah, you know, enough. Enough about Zoom calls, guys. Uh, let's talk about sampling <laughs> and bouncing from uh, place to place. Uh, so you know, if you guys, if you're if you're into lawsuits and uh, and getting you know getting copyright strikes, etc. This is, you know, again, using the setup that we talked about earlier, right? So configure speakers, and I want these to come in virtual one, virtual two. And, and the reason I had to go change those is because I changed my I.O. setup here. But now that I have virtual one, virtual two as my system audio, I can come into Luna here. Let me open up a session, make an audio track. Now, you know, I'm going to go so fast, I'm not even going to bother naming it. Set my input two, dun, 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 virtual one, two. 
Now, if I put this in, you know, put this in, I'll just put it in input monitor because we don't need to actually sit here and record anything today. Uh, we just start playing some tracks from Spotify. And now you can see my Spotify music is flowing here into Luna. So this is a great, you know, and this is not just a Luna thing. You guys can do this with Pro Tools, Ableton, Logic, anything that you have your Apollo connected to. You can sample um, sample sources that are whatever's coming out your system audio. Again, by coming up to the the speaker icon and telling it use Universal Audio Thunderbolt. Since I came in here and told it my speakers are actually this virtual device, send it there. I can now bring that in. Uh, I can sample just like you would back in the day. Um, and of course, you know, you know, we're skipping over the fact that like you can not only can you sample it, but you can also come in here. You know, and you can hit it with a uh, hit it with some distressor. You can you can you can kind of mess spank with it. it. You can spank it. Ben, you can do I think, it. You can... I think you have a problem. You have a. I think, have a I, think I, I might I might have a distressor problem. I might be in distress. Uh, so this is a quick and easy way. I know a lot of folks use this this workflow for sampling stuff off of YouTube. It's it's a great way to get uh you know vocal samples or cool Bollywood tracks into into what you're doing. Um, but there's a you know there's a lot of other great uses for this besides uh, getting sued. I mean uh, sampling records. Uh, and one you know we'll talk about the we'll talk about the dumping from uh, from one DAW to another. But before I give up my screen, uh, I really I want to highlight something like this. This is a VCV rack. Uh, for those, hopefully a bunch of you guys are if you're uh, synth nerds like me, uh, you'll be aware of this one. But this is essentially a virtual modular synth. And what it allows you to do is, uh, you know, you can patch things together just like you would um, on a real modular synth. Bring that down here, uh, and it allows you to try out. There's so many great modules in here, but it allows you to make, you know, uh, make a bunch of different uh, patches. And then for your audio in and out, you can see what I what I'm doing here is I just selected. Again, I'm, this is something that's going to come up time and time again for you guys. When you're some some uh, you know core audio, some places it's a lot easier to keep track of this stuff. But in some you know instances, that's just numbered channels. So I'm like, all right, uh, great. Where did I put my virtual channels? Um, so you're going to come into your I/O matrix and then you know virtual one two. Uh, since they're in, I think Ableton will kind of run into this too. You can see here in VCV rack, it's just saying one through eight, nine through sixteen. You know, it's going in in pairs of eight, but they're all unlabeled; they're just numbered. So we're going to need to pay attention to an IO matrix. Is here's my virtual one two, and then right here thirty one and thirty two. Those are the numbers I need to know. So I'm going to go uh, third. Yep, through to thirty two. Oh, I might just crash VCV rack by telling it to assign the same thing it was already assigned to. And then I just select channels 31 and 32 by selecting 7 and 8 on its output. Um, and with that running, which it probably isn't anymore because I just crashed it, uh, it would show up here inside of Luna as an, as an audio device. Uh, so this is, this is something you can really you can put to use not just to sample things, but to record in external instruments like VCV rack. Um, you know, I've got there's other you know, synths where you can just run you know, something like circle. Or sublab or other ones control these with a MIDI keyboard, process them through your virtual channels in real time, and then record that into Luna. Um, it's a different, it's a very different workflow. You're not preserving MIDI, you're not recording that sort of stuff, um, but you can. Uh, it's a great way to be able to quickly get audio through some processing and then committed into Luna with some processing on it. Which, speaking of committing to processing, I wanted to highlight, guys, here on the Universal Audio blog, this is the, the article I was mentioning earlier uh, about Tyler, the creator, uh, with Vic. So, A, it's a great article. You should definitely check it out. Uh, but most importantly, there was, to me, one of the coolest things that he talked about here in the record um, was how they used Apollo's and console app to render files from one DAW to another. Uh, so, you know, you can obviously check out, read their thought process and explanation behind why they did it. Uh, and of course he explains how he set this up in a console, but I believe Matt, we've got Matt's set up here. This is, this is kind of mirroring what Vic was talking about, right? Where you've got your production happening in Ableton or Logic or, you know, whatever DAW and you want to commit those tracks, you know, you can, of course you could write, you could just export each track as an, as an individual thing and, and pop it into your DAW. 
Uh, but if you wanted to process it in real time with some UAD to add, you know, say like a touch of like SSL character or a little bit of a Neve thing, this is this is kind of a cool trick to be able to do that, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, that, that's pretty much what I got set up here. Um, I got some stems going in Ableton Live. Um, in this scenario, I'm going to print them into Luna, but it could be any application sending to another application or any DAW sending to another DAW. Um, we're just using these two for the example. Um, but yeah, let's walk through it. So basically going to the gist of it is i'm going to send from ableton through the virtual channels i'm going to process it with some plugins there and then capture it into luna um so i can do the rest of my mix so on the ableton side um pretty much what i did is just have my sem set up and uh setting them out to external outputs which is just lets me send to something other than the main output um, so i'm sending my drums to virtual one and two i'm sending my bass to virtual three and four and then I have my samples all grouped together because um, I only have so many virtual channels in my particular setup. Uh, they're all going to virtual five and six. Okay. So then over in Luna, I'm pretty much mirroring the same thing. I got three stereo inputs set up, um, one set to virtual one and two, virtual three and four, and virtual five and six. Um, so basically set up to send from Ableton and capture uh, into Luna on those virtual channels. Nice. And uh, so, so yeah, since... since so it's basically yeah. like bouncing out of a, you know, tra we've shown this before. It's like tracking out, you know, from an NPC or tracking out from one place to another. You're able to kind of do this, but with multiple tracks all at the same time. So this way, you know, capturing subgroups or capturing individual tracks, the same trick kind of works, right? Yeah, exactly. And it, it's like not just for printing. I mean, even if you're just monitoring, it's kind of a cool trick. So it lets you monitor through. Uh, I can load, for example, a bunch of SSLE channels and all the virtual channels, um, and I can monitor the playback of Ableton through these SSL channels, just like you would with like a, an actual mixing desk, um, where you're actually playing the, the DAW tracks back through channels and using the, the console itself to, to affect things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in Luna, you know, you can just load it right into the record effects here. If I was capturing the audio into something else, um, you could open up console and just load up uh, whatever plugins you want to print through onto those virtual channels that you know if you're printing into pro tools or something like that uh but yes yeah, so now that i have that's that that's a good way up, to like commit uh, like your tape processing or something you know like that'd be a really mm -hmm. great way to do tape you know like if you if you wanted totally. to transfer your multi-track all in one shot all getting tape so that when you get to the destination there's less dsp needed something like that'd be good good use yeah, and, and there's a bunch of different ways you could do it. I mean, you can just uh, load the plugins directly on the track in, in Ableton. But I think there's something to be said for this kind of workflow where you're actually committing to whatever plugins you have loaded on those virtual channels and, and printing them mm -hmm. into the other DAW. Yeah, um, and that's yeah, what they talked about. That's that. what they talked about in the interview, right? Was they were like they they kept on listening to the to the beats, you know, through an SSL console or through a console at the studio. That that's how they they came up with the tracks and they were listening to them that way for the longest time. And then when they would just do a bounce to disc and then bring it into Pro Tools, it didn't have the same. It didn't have the same feel. Like Tyler was so sen he was very sensitive to the fact that it didn't sound how good it sounded when he was at the studio. And they they were racking their brain about why it sound why why did it sound so good in the studio and now it sounds like okay. A lot of that was the 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 little touch of of saturation of coloration that they were getting from the console. So this workflow that we're showing you guys, this is what they this, this is what they did to uh, to impart a little bit of that color to the tracks as they brought them in from uh, from Logic into Pro Tools, or as we're showing here today, from Live into Luna. Uh, this workflow works in multiple different DAWs. The big important thing here right, is this is kind of a one way street. This is a transfer process. So you you're working in one DAW and then you're bringing it over into another. So all these tracks will end up perfectly in sync. And they'll now have that that little bit of SSL e channel color to them as well that you know mirrors what you would get off of a an analog console. Yeah, yeah, and that point you just made about it being a one way street and doing it all together is great um, because, like we mentioned earlier in the stream, there can be some delay compensation weirdness that happens when you're printing from one application to another. Um, but as long as you're printing everything at the same time, you know, one way, uh, everything will be delay compensated by the same amount or not um, so everything will still be lined up when it makes it into luna so yeah it's definitely very important that you do this all in one shot for this particular workflow nice so then so yeah, uh, um, what's the yeah how do you that's uh so that's the routing that's the processing and then what's the kind of the final step here yeah, so since I'm using applications that, that work with MIDI Beat Clock, um, I have it set up so Luna is actually sending uh, MIDI Beat Clock to Ableton. So it kind of simplifies the process so that all I have to do now is just hit record and play in Luna. Um, Ableton is synced. You can see the EXT buttons lit up here. So it's receiving MIDI Beat Clock from Luna. 
Uh, so as soon as I hit record and play, Ableton's going to start playing in sync with Luna, and then we can track it in. So let's take a look at that. So yeah, we'll, we'll do the whole thing. But um, you can see everything's perfectly in sync. You know, all the tracks are in sync with each other. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty much as simple as that. You can just repeat that workflow to, to transfer things from one DAW to another all together, um, all through processing. Nice. I uh, saw so a question here in the chat, you know, asking, you know, did you load the SSL in, in, on your virtual channels inside a console or inside a Luna, or does it matter where you load uh, the plugin? No, I mean, since I'm using Luna, I could do it directly from the uh, the record effect slots in Luna. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're printing into Pro Tools or something like that, uh, you would actually want to go into console and, and load it uh, on the console channels. But um, for Luna, it's the same either way. Whether I load them in record effects or I load them in console, they both end up in the same place, um, which is the, the first four slots in the top of uh, the virtual channels in console. So yeah, it's the same same process either way. But if you are using another DAW other than Luna, you'll, you'll want to use console mm -hmm. directly. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So yeah, man, this is such a cool way to be able to print through effects, be able to capture capture the sound. Uh, and as Matt just showed you guys, you can do this. You know, uh, we talked about this I think back when uh, MIDI Beat Clock became part of Luna, right? We did a big deep dive about all the different ways to use Beat Clock. This is actually one of this is a very similar example to what we showed then of syncing Luna uh, in Ableton uh, to be able to you know kind of be your sequencer over in Ableton and then your multi-track console and tape machine over here inside of Luna. Yeah, exactly. Nice. That's awesome, man. So that's that's how you guys can print from one to another. And now for possibly one of the most most mind-blowing and awesome uses of virtual channels. This one Drew this one's complex. This is not this is not uh, not everyone's first thought about it, but this is <laughs> dude, once you showed me this, this was like it made so much sense. So this is Essentially, this is like a vocal or this is like an overdub workflow, right? When yeah, it's definitely an overdub workflow. And this is something that I stumbled on. I don't even, I've been doing it for many, many years. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's just a way of simplifying um, how, how you're, you're tracking. Um, and it works. I'm going to show you two different configurations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to, I don't know if you want to go ahead and, yeah, yep. go ahead and share screen. And let's, so let, so uh, let's take a look at this. This is going to be a workflow that you're going to use with console and a third party DAW. Um, ironically, Luna solves this entire problem for you. So if you're a Luna user and you're committed to, Lu to Luna, you are going to appreciate one of the amazing <laughs> aspects of Luna because Luna, this is what I had to do before Luna to, to streamline my workflow. Mm -hmm. So right now you're hearing me right now. You're hearing me through my stream mic over here. Um, and uh, at some point I'll turn that off, but I, I want to draw your attention to this area over here. Um, if we first look at, uh, my input section here. Uh, I have this se a separate mic. I have an SM7 coming in on input one, and I have a uh, I have a Helios uh, plugin. Which, by the way, if you're an SM7 user, be sure you have got the Helios because <laughs> 70 it's dB a, again. It's a it's a marriage <laughs> made in heaven. Uh -huh. These two guys, they love each other. They love each other for sure. Yeah. So, and it's really it's just great sounding gain too. Um, anyway, so I have the Helios in the the Unison slot, and that will commit. Of course, we all know that the Unison slot commits. But down below it, in my insert section, you'll see that I'm also tracking with some compression. In this case, the uh, the silver LE2, one of my favorites. Um, but you'll notice I have it set to monitor. So we have the little mm -hmm. blue light as opposed to the little red light. Um, and so that's the that's what we're calling that's my input path. Uh, and I'm not going to open this up just yet because then I'll start going through that channel. But um, so. What's cool about this is uh, on here, I have my aux one and aux two are sending over to my effects. So over here in this area, I have uh, EMT plate and Cooper time cube, and they're going to, you know, the main out. Uh, there's nothing there now, of course, because this channel is muted and those sends are post fader. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is what, you know, this is what we're all used to doing. This is what we would consider, you know, a, a monitor. This would be our, 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 uh, Gosh, direct monitoring, right? We, we have our DAW, which in this case is Pro Tools. We have it in LLM mode or low latency monitor mode. So it mutes the input that's being fed to it. Mm -hmm. And so let, let me switch over. So I'm going to mute my stream mic. And so now I'm over here on the SM7. So you should be hearing me. <laughs> a little you delay. Me with a bunch of verb and delay, right? Yeah. Yep. So yep. let's pretend we're doing some vocals. 
Um, if, I, if I go over to Pro Tools, you'll see that that signal is getting to Pro Tools. And because low latency monitoring mode is on, we're not hearing it twice. So Pro Tools knows to keep that shut down. Mm -hmm. um, let me go back to console. And so this is my record workflow. So, and I'm hearing with all of my effects. So I'm gonna, I'm, let's just go over to Pro Tools. Let's just hit record three. And well, I had a little bit of pre-roll. So we're gonna start recording now. And now I'm recording. And while I'm recording, I have my, my live mic, I have my effects, and I'm gonna hit stop. Now, uh, the, the trick is that this, tr this track in Pro Tools is, is being outputted instead of to the mon left and right. Instead, it's going to, let me just, I can't see it when it goes off the screen. Um, it's going to some outputs that I specifically keep in my IO matrix. So hopefully this will let you see that. Yep. Um, yeah, so, so you'll notice I keep, I keep a pair of virtuals and I, I call them return one dash two and they can be accessed either as mono outputs, which is what I'm doing now. In the second thing I'm gonna show you uh, with the sphere mic, uh, I'll show you how you can do a really streamlined workflow with the sphere and therefore, and there you need two of them because obviously it's two channels. Um, so what's cool about this is that now when I play this back and if you go back to console, you'll notice over here, here's my return track. And what I've done here is I've copied the compressor from my mic track over to the, uh, and these are probably getting on your nerves, so let me just move these. Um, <laughs> well, maybe, just sw maybe switch your, your live mic back to uh, your broadcast oh, yeah. one. Yeah, let me, let me do that, yeah. Okay, so yeah, back, back to the broadcast mic. So, so what's cool about this is now my return track brings that playback signal back into console mm -hmm. and I while running it through the exact same compressor yep. and running it back through the same effects. So if essentially when I go back to Pro Tools and hit play, you're gonna hear what I just tracked a minute ago. So we're gonna start recording now. And now I'm recording. And and what it's what you what you're hearing is that it now has the exact same comp playback compression mm -hmm. and it has the exact same effects. So I'm no longer I'm only have to maintain one set of effects. It's just uh, the it, one it, plate and the so one key. So fast. It's such a such yeah. a cool workflow for like yeah, if you're gonna do like multiple tracks of vocals, right? Or just you're yeah. punching if you're punching in and out, it it doesn't matter. No matter what your singer the singer in their headphones, right? They're gonna be hearing they're you know they're hearing all the the la 2a the reverb and delay it's just consistent whether or not whether they're punching it on a take or they're warming up for a take it doesn't matter exactly they're always yep. getting the same sound and then you just duplicate track by track by track and say you know what I have these always send out to return one uh yeah so it gets the same treatment each time now of course if you are if you've got 20 vocal tracks you're now going to be funneling 20 vocal tracks down through that one return but typically you know for I've done this for you know four or six tracks and so long as you're working the the the, the monitor the return faders you you know as you stack them up just pull them back a little bit and mm -hmm. what's really it's just it's just a great way to be able to ma manage you know the same effects the same processing um for both inputs and outputs yeah, um, and and as we as you mentioned, you know, this is something that now you know with Luna, this is kind of all taken care of for you, right? So yeah. like you, can, you can just oh duplicate, God, you yeah. can record, duplicate tracks, monitor, input monitor, not input monitor. It kind of yep. handle. It, this is this is a great workflow for working inside of Pro Tools or Live or Logic, where you want that consistent sound. You want to be able to you know have the unison processing and then monitor through some compression and some reverb and delay. And have that yep. consistency from one to the other, uh, but this is you know one of the one of the reasons why they made Luna was like they're like you know there's an easier way than this to <laughs> to monitor through effects and have it be consistently low latency real time yeah. experience for folks. Yeah, and then so just I can I don't need to step through it entirely, but you'll also notice in my Pro Tools template um, I also have the same thing uh, set up right here with this Sphere. Uh, so when I'm doing Sphere. You know, mm -hmm. when you're recording Sphere into Pro Tools, you want to, it needs to be on a, on a stereo track. So I have this vocal called Sphere, and you'll notice that it's outputting to return 1-2. Uh, uh, so this way, what this allows you to do is, and I'll just try and mock this up real quick. First of all, you're going to want to, you know, you're going to want to right click and hit link on your returns. And now the returns, uh, you know, will turn into a stereo uh, channel. Mm -hmm. And what you can do now is go in here to the microphone processing um, and let's just throw this on here. Um, and so what this allows you to do 
is to do basically the same thing where you are monitoring. Uh, and of course I would have to be over here with some linked channels. So I'd, let's say I link three and four and I put it in monitor mode and I do the same thing here with the, uh, with the sphere. So this is the same exact configuration except on stereo channels. And you've got the same concept here where your live input is running, monitoring through sphere and your playbacks are playing back through sphere. Um, so it's a, a very quick and easy way to stack up vocals, never having to think about at, or, or change the monitor path or the return path because everything is, is uh, encoded and decoded uh, in real time using virtuals. So Dude, it's, it's, it's a really cool way to be able to, you know, especially if you, if you don't necessarily want to commit to the sound immediately and be able to pass it through again. Yeah. Uh, it's a, if you guys, if you, anything like me, the first time Drew explained this to me, I was lost. And then he explained it the second time I started to get it. the third time I, I got it. And now this fourth time it, <laughs> it all makes perfect sense, but it is, uh, it's, it's a really cool way if you're, if you're working in other DAWs to be able to leverage the best of console, the real time nature of your Apollo and that processing, plus being able to, uh, you know, record on the individual tracks inside of your DAW, um, so yeah, man, that's uh, another really powerful use for uh, powerful and complex use for, uh, for virtual channels. Yeah. And the, the moral of the story is, uh, use Luna. Yeah. <laughs> that's the short answer. Right? That's the short answer. It just, it's made my, like, I, you know, as a tracking engineer with people in here all the time and time is money and you got people in the booth and you need to work fast. The expectation is that you can, you know, good engineers are able to just do, 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 and, and, and stack and stack and do this. And so this is a really efficient, it's worth getting over the hump of understanding it and putting it into practice because it will make you look like a pro. It'll make you look like a champ to your clients or to your friends or whoever you're tracking. You'll just look like, you know, you got your act together. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Check it out. Uh, so a couple of seeing some good questions coming in here. We'll try to get to a bunch of them. Uh, and then we've also, if you guys, if you guys want to hang in there, like you guys seem to be hanging out, uh, we'll get to the, to the plugin feature here as well. Uh, if you guys are interested in knowing more about Voxbox, I guess, uh, give us like a little raise your hand if you want to see us talk about Voxbox while we try to get through some of these questions real quick. Um, you know, so people, you know, does this, does this, all the stuff that we're showing, does this work with ADAT devices? Um, and yeah, as far as I know, right, Matt, the ADAT digital inputs, uh, almost all the workflow stuff that we've been showing you guys here today apply there as well, right? Yeah, they're, they're treated pretty much just like the analog inputs, the virtual channels, you can process them and route them the same way we've been showing you. Mm -hmm. Um, and let's see when arm, when arm is engaged, does signal only pass to monitor left and right, uh, for your main yes. outputs. Yes, but you still have access to the cues. So your cues and aux one and aux two, those you'll notice those are always a uh, special conditions. And uh, I'd, I'd recommend we did a, we just did a show a couple of weeks ago uh, talking a lot about arm mode uh, and some of these some of these topics. But yeah, when arm is engaged, uh, the Apollo and Luna work together to do everything they can to make sure your you and your musicians are getting a low latency experience. Uh, so that means you know, it won't pass through buses unless they're arm enabled. Um, and even then, you know, you're going to want to use those for time effects, like your reverb and delay, just like, uh, what Drew is showing us. Uh, but yeah, it, it bypasses AU plugins, anything that would cause latency to your signal, Luna automatically gets it out of the way. So that way the, what's going to the headphones and going to the speakers is all as low latency as possible. Um, da, da, da. trying to get through, scroll back up on questions. Uh, a lot of, a lot of windows requests. Of course. Yep. We heard, we got you guys, uh, we're hearing you, but, uh, for right now we're, we're focusing it all on, uh, it's all on Mac at the moment. Um, all right. I think guys, if, if I missed a question, just hit me up, hit, hit us up in the, in the chat here. Hopefully you guys are, you know, it's down to see this, the box box, uh, people asking about side chain control surface future, all these future features guys, the, the team's working on them. Um, you know, they, they're hearing your feedback, so keep on letting them know via the feedback button how important these things are. Uh, and the team is working really hard uh, to bring you guys awesome features here down the road uh, and as soon as possible, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, da, da, da. M1, M1 support. Uh, right now, uh, there's a knowledge base article about uh, UAD and M1. Uh, so it's got directions about how to get it installed and working. Uh, and by working, it's it's not fully supported. That's the big thing we got to tell you guys right now, right? Is that it's not 
fully, fully supported. However, I can tell I can confirm I've got an M1 right now and uh, it does work. There's some stuff uh, with Luna instruments that don't quite work with M1 yet. Uh, and again, the team is working really hard in the background to, uh, to fully support that here soon. Yep. Um, dun, dun, dun. Is there, I wonder, is, is there, is there a marker or a way to stop? Uh, is there, I'm wondering if there's a marker or some way for the song you're playing to end and slash stop without you having to stop it manually. Um, I mean, you can, you can make a selection on the timeline. Uh, typically, it'll start looping by default, but you can turn loop off, and then it will stop and start based on your timeline selection if you turn off the loop uh, in the transport controls. Uh, da, da, da. Asking about A, A and D. Yep. Workflow goal. Set NPC to play, go into sampler, hit record, play drums live. Yep, I... Uh, that's a great, great workflow example, I, and we've show, we've showcased that before. I've I've shown how to integrate an NPC uh, with Luna back in. I think it was right around the time MIDI Beat Clock dropped uh, last year. Um, Ahmed saying, well, "Any idea why vocals in Luna can get phasey at times? Do the vocals record over each other for each version?" Um, I mean, it shouldn't be. Uh, vocals vocals in Luna should not be phasing. Make sure that you have arm mode turned on uh, and make sure that you, you're not trying to run console and Luna both simultaneously. I'm trying to think of ways or reasons well, that you can be getting phasing. Maybe console tracking mode. If console tracking yeah, mode is on, then maybe you're hearing that you're hearing the live mic along with the backgrounds. Maybe, you know, maybe it. Uh, so that when you punch in, you're actually hearing both, or, or you know, or when you, as you're leading up to your punch-ins, you'd be hearing them both, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that might be it. Uh, yeah, we already talked about the upcoming stuff. Uh, <laughs> iPad Pro. When's when's Luna coming to the iPad Pro? Uh, yeah. As soon as iLock runs on iOS. <laughs> That's there we go. <laughs> there's some, you know, there's some stumbling blocks. There's some stumbling blocks, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Nice. All right. Well, I think I think we're caught up in questions, guys. If we missed a question, just uh, hit us up here again uh, and asking for future features. Uh, uh, Drew or Matt, you guys, what's the what's the what's the refrain for uh, future f features? Future. Nothing to announce at this time. <laughs> That's the uh, no. I, I mean, the one hit thing I always say about button. the future. Yeah, hit the feedback button. And the one thing is like. Uh, some of these features are super long-term in their scope. And so we have like so much stuff going on right now that's in progress and in various states of completion. And the team is, you know, working on many, many things at once. So just because we haven't done your thing doesn't mean we're ignoring it. doesn't mean it's like at the end of the line. It could very well be in development and just not ready yet. So like, you know, control surface support, super complicated, you know, side chain, super complicated. So like, you know, we got all sorts of stuff coming. So it's like, uh, it's, it's exciting times, but we just, you know, we just ask everybody be patient and, uh, hang in there with us. Yeah. And since we got, since we're all family here, uh, guys, there's, there's some stuff coming up here pretty soon. Very like a couple, couple of weeks, like the next couple of weeks are gonna be a lot of fun. We're, not next week, week after we're, uh, we're going to be announcing a bunch of, uh, live stream shows. We've got some really epic shows coming up for you guys. Uh, so, you know, if you're trying to make vacation plans or anything right now, just make sure you're not traveling on May 11th or May 12th. <laughs> just keep those days open on your calendar because we're uh, we've got two back-to-back -back amazing live stream shows, uh, and you guys know that usually when we have amazing big live stream shows that I'm going to tease about here, that that kind of means something. You know, you know what I'm Take saying. Take a personal day. Hint, hint. Take a personal yeah, day. Yeah, exactly, guys. Uh, <laughs> but Drew, let's uh, let's get into this Fox Box, man. This is I know we're we're going we're going long, but uh, folks are hanging here with us, and uh, this is also you know we're kind of deep diving on all these different channel strips because, frankly, like channel strips, they're a lot of fun to use. They pack a lot of power and functionality into a single plugin, so they're also a great deal for folks, right? Like yeah. if, you're, if you're trying to get a plugin that can do more than one thing and is useful for, you know, vocals, guitars, for <clears throat> multiple different sources, compressors, EQs. And today, you know, we're going to talk about the Manly Vox Box, which is, it's got some features that you literally won't find in any other channel strip. Yeah, for real. It's, uh, yeah. And, and just to speak what you just said, Ben there, that the whole idea of like channel strips are one of the only ways to get compression and preamp and maybe compression and EQ, but then be able to put a de -esser in the 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 uh, non-printing slots you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it's like 
it's a great way of consolidating processes into one single unison slot. So, um, and yeah, so the Vox box is the one that we're going to talk about today. And this one is super unique. Uh, and you know, I, I've, you know, we've all loved this plugin for many, many years and, but, I, but in prepping for these, you know, like I, I, I really dig into them back into them and sort of reintroduce myself to them and then fall in love with them all over again. So uh -huh. I'm super, I'm super happy that people are liking these because like I, we're having a great time doing them. And, um, so yeah, so let's just jump right to it. And as we've as we've been doing in the past, you know, the first order of business is to just take a little tour of the GUI and just sort of talk about um, what's going on here. Um, Voxbox is really kind of uh, segmented, and you can see visually how it's really kind of broken up into these various segments. So if we move left to right, um, we can start off with you know just the the internal power button, or which is basically the internal bypass. We've been stressing this a bunch. This is the this is what you want to use for a glitch free. A, B, right? This is what you want, as opposed to the power button, um, which uh, could potentially, is the one that releases the DSP and might impact delay compensation. So this is the, uh, that internal bypass, which is the safe glitchless uh, uh, bypass. So we, we can start there. Um, right here, we got the, you know, that international symbol for high <laughs> pass, right? Or low cut, mm -hmm. both mean the same thing. Um, and we've got, you know, of course, a flat setting, 80 and 120. You can cl click right on the uh, badges to get to get to them. Which, uh, I have it set to 120. This is the thing you guys are going to find all over this plugin is the fact that it's 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 called the Vox Box, and they call it the Vox Box because it's so tuned in and tailored to doing vocals. So having 80 and 120, right? So 80, you're getting you're getting rid of thumps. So you're getting rid of like really yeah. like low low stuff. 120, you're starting to kind of like give a softer low and a little bit less proximity. Uh, yeah, so rather than proximity like, effect. Yep. Mm -hmm, so rather than like 50 yeah. and 100, or you know, like the, all these settings are so tuned in. You'll, you'll notice it as Drew keeps on working to the right. Like everything that's present inside this plugin is there to help craft a great sounding vocal, and it yeah. starts with a high pass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and and you know, spoiler alert: you can use it on anything, right? You know, I mean, it's tailored mm -hmm. for vocals, and it's the name is Vox Box. But yeah, you'll 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 want to use this on a lot of stuff. Um, all right, so down from there, we have uh, if we come over to the source. Now, I have it set to mic, but on this plugin, you're gonna. This is different than the ones we've previously shown, the 88RS and the SSL. In that, this one, it's the same amplifier, um, mm -hmm. and, and in fact, there's really only a four dB difference between the two. Uh, and I happen to have my demo here today in mic mode, but this is this is uh, the the only time this really matters is on your Apollo in the unison slot. If you are coming into the line input, then you want to set it to line. Uh, if you're coming into the TRS and you need it to, you know, you want to access the line input. And, and if you're on mic, you're on mic. But if you're in your DAW, if you're in Luna processing playback tracks, then really these are only, they're the same thing, but just a 4 dB difference. Um, I happen to have it in the mic mode for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, someone in chat was asking about the what how, gen, how that low cut filter uh and i just oh, looked yeah. up i just looked up in the DB. manual 6 yeah. db yep yeah. so it's a, yeah. it's a real gentle, gentle one so gentle mm -hmm. right um, yeah and that it goes back again to that whole idea of like i don't know what that slope is but guess what i don't care i just you know it's ears. like that's what yeah that, and that's the beauty of this gear the gear the gear is helping you people people you know uh, just because you can do 36 db per octave doesn't mean it's going to sound better Everything you do to audio is, is induces phase shift. So the steeper that filter, the more you're messing with the low end, whether you realize it or not. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, to the right of that, we have uh, our polarity inversion. A lot of people call that phase reversal, but technically technically speaking, it's a polarity inversion, flips the positive and the negative. Mm -hmm. um, and then down here, this is where things get interesting because yeah. this is the, sig <laughs> the signal <laughs> flow of this guy is super interesting. It can be, it can be very, it, there's a real simple way to think about it guys. And there's a complex way to think about it. So let's start, yeah. start with the simple way, which is read the numbers on there, decide how much gain you want, turn it, you know, say you're working with like an SM7, right? You want a lot of gain. You just default, you go to 60 and then you, and you know, use the input knob. But Drew, yeah, this is, this is really complex. So break it down yeah, for, so for folks how this works. <laughs> Yeah, so this 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 is super important and to really maximize what you get out of this because what Ben said about the gain is right, but there's more to it than that. So, for example, from a signal flow perspective, and this doesn't make a lot of sense visually, but from a signal flow perspective, this input knob, which is is, is uh, comes first, then it goes through the compressor, mm -hmm. and then it goes to the gain. And this gain is not just a gain setting. It's not just adding or subtracting dB, and you can try this for yourself. 
it actually it's I'm not an electronics guy. Will Will Shanks, our, our plugging guru, knows about all this stuff. Uh, he could explain it better than me. But basically, these gain settings are not just gain. And I in my I don't know if I, I'll be able to show it or if it'll translate. But in prepping this demo, there's a definite difference between. Uh, these gain settings as far as transient response and the behavior of the actual preamp. It, it really mm -hmm. is worth like just going through all these. It's not just about the amount of gain you need. Exactly. Um, it, it actually has a, it has to do with the saturation because it's part of the feedback of, of the preamp. Right. Uh, yeah. and you're, you're so right. Like you're going input level through the compressor and then back and through that gain uh, switch. So in a, in a sense, some people kind of think of this like that's a, it's a saturation control in a sense, right? So like, when you're on 60, you're driving the feedback part of the circuit as much as possible. Um, and so you can get yeah. a little bit more color, a little bit more of that, of the, the even harmonics, I believe, is uh, what this one's kind of known for. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, uh, yeah, so you, this is basically, you know, this comes first and then your compressor. This is kind of interesting because your compressor is actually, op it's an optic optical compressor, not unlike the LA-2 in the same basic structure. Um and, but it's happening to the mic level signal uh, and it's not impacted by this. So mm -hmm. what's interesting is that this knob will impact your compression. Adjusting this will not because mm -hmm. it comes after it. So it's literally like input knob determines the amount of signal that you're allowing into the circuit. Then you can compress it and then you decide on a makeup, sort of makeup preamp or, or the coloration or the, or the flavor of the preamp. So very, uh, very unique structure, very interesting uh, structure and um yeah so yeah. any thoughts or questions about that should i keep going what do you think keep, keep going and, there, and also okay. if uh if you if you folks are if you're diving in we actually we have got another article on the blog uh about the vox box so if you if you head to uaudio.com mm -hmm. search for vox box um you'll find there's a great article i believe we did it with uh chuck zawicki where he mm -hmm. uh he broke down one of his presets and he got ultra nerdy detailed about how this feedback integrates into the sound design, um, yeah. of, of his preset. But again, for, you know, for you folks at home and, you know, I, I highlighted this, this plugin, uh, with the video with Greaves where we talked about recording hip hop vocals. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's the same, like, man, this is, it's such a great go-to one because, uh, you know, complexity aside about how this gain structure and feedback all works. The fact is, is like you're going to use your input till you're getting signal that you like. You're going to dial in the the compressor till it's compressing and, and kind of holding the vocals in the spot that you like. You've got attack and release to kind of tweak and get to how you like. I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not changing ratios or you. You know, it's either are you compressing or not. Great. Here's a nice gentle <laughs> optical yep. optical based compressor add your gain to it and then and then from there it's it's on to you know a perfectly tailored deesser and eq circuit as well yeah so it's a, you know so as we're moving over to here to the left we can look at the meter knob which shows you gain reduction line in preamp out eq out and the deessing section so there's a lot of a lot of visual feedback that you can get from here i generally uh you know, uh, obviously the, the preamp output and the EQ output, you want to make sure you can check how much, if you're blowing it up a lot over here, you can make sure you're not driving too much level. You can see what the compressor is doing. You can see what the de is doing. Uh, all pretty straightforward there. Uh, attack and release. Um, make sure that you are, this is a unique circuit and make, make sure you're, you're reading the manual on this because there's lots of little tidbits in the manual. These, <laughs> the, these attack and release controls are interrelated. Uh, in fact, the, you know, and the, it's, you know, Again, uh, uh, it's just make sure you're you're reading the details there because and lots of experimentation. You know, make sure you're experimenting with things. Um, mm -hmm. We have a, we have uh, five different settings here on both the attack and the release, and uh, I happen to be doing fast and fast. That's uh, this is what I'm. You're going to hear in a second. It's a big, it's a big sort of dense production, and and it needs that kind of control. But uh, so, there's a lot to lot to experiment here. So for folks for folks at home, Drew, like you know, let's let's think about it this way. Like the for for me when it comes to release on vocals, my default is going to be fast, right? Like yeah. typically, you kind of you want the compressor to back off as quickly as possible, so I can hear the next bit of detail, or like you know, like if they sing a loud note and then and then I want to hear the the clo the the end of what they're saying. I want to get that that presence and detail back. Having a fast release allows the compressor to, oh, okay, cool. I'm done compressing as quickly as possible. 
Yeah, well, it, not only that, it's it's letting that that letting go feature, that releasing and returning to unity gain or letting go of the compression is what our ear grabs a hold of. It, it, you know, in it, when it's the negative connotation of that is pumping, right? People exactly. say oh, it's pumping. Mm -hmm. You know, but th there's a positive connotation to that, which is the movement, right? And the yep. energy. That's what you know, like kind of punch and vibe. That's what makes people. That's what when compression makes people sound more aggressive. And having more motion and more movement, that's that fast release. Your ear grabs a hold of that quick change and that rapid change in amplitude. Your ear's drawn to that and goes, ooh, you know, oh, that's that's rapidly changing. I like that. It's It makes it sound, you know, mm -hmm. and the slower you go, the more gentle it will be uh, is a good good way to think well, about it. Well, and sometimes, sometimes it, and you go from like, a oh, this sounds kind of pumped to like, oh, this sounds kind of soft and gooey or it may even, yeah. to me, yep. sometimes if you have too long of a release, it just sounds like it's compressed all the time. Like it's constantly under compression and you may be missing the ends of words or, or bits of the phrase. So it, that's why for me, like the default is to go to fast. And then if it feels too aggressive or if it feels yep. too, uh, you know, it's pumping in and out too much and I'm hearing the compression too much, maybe I'll go to medium, fast or medium. So yeah. for me, it's the release time is one of the most important ones to get to really affect the character of, of how the compression results feel. And then the yeah. attack is, you know, it's the opposite side of this equation, right? So when you have a fast attack, it's going to react quickly. It's going to, it's going to jump, jump and get to it, right? Which can yep. be good can be good for for a lot of vocals, and this is you know one of the one of the things that Bill Putnam Senior was looking to do when he invented the 175, 176, and then into the 1176. Oh, yeah. He was all about trying to get a really fast attack, something that could just almost instantly detect. Oh, we've gone over my threshold. Let's bring that down. Let's react to it really quickly. So that and way, protect those transmitters, like the you know protect those broadcast transmitters. Like you couldn't mm -hmm. overmodulate them, or you you know you would get fined and you know whatever. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, if you if you spilled out into other people's frequencies and stuff like that, yeah. So, so our ben the benefit for us is it can really it, that's where we can really sort of manhandle stuff and really grab those transients and uh, sort of rein them in. Which in most pop music, in most modern genres, you kind of want that more. You know, mm -hmm. um, well, back to the release thing though. The slower releases, if you if you if you they're good for gentle leveling. Like if you like, you, I, I'm with you, Ben. I'm always uh, uh, start fast and then kind of yeah. mellow it from there to get leveling. That's where I feel like they're leveling. As opposed to compression, you know. Totally. Compressing. Well, and, and then that's where, like, for the, on the attack, like, if you start, if you, if you, you know, attack essentially, especially when you start doing stuff with like guitars or drums, uh, the voice is, the voice, you know, is kind of like a string instrument, right? Where, like, you don't really get, the, unless it's like a P or a B, you don't have a ton of transient stuff happening with most vocal sounds. But with a guitar, with a pick or a piano or something that has yeah. a hammered nature to it, uh, fast attacks, you know, it may actually, it may do too much too fast. So a lot of times, like with drums, you'll notice we'll do like a fast release and a medium or a slower attack to let more transient through before the compressor acts. Um, but for voices, it can often sound really good to have a faster attack. So that way it's responding a little bit more naturally with the envelope of a voice and or grabbing anything that's like a P or B kind of exploding out of the mouth into the compressor. Uh, mm -hmm. So, again, the cool thing about this, guys, is we're not talking about numbers here. We're talking about, you know, fast, medium, fast, medium, medium, slow. There's five options for each one. If you're if you're in a session with somebody or if you're, you know, kind of messing around with this plugin on a mix, take the time to try each one of these and listen, see if you can hear what it's doing to the track. Uh, this is the mm -hmm. best way to build up the, your, your kind of oral memory for... Oh, I, I remember I, I love, you know, Ben and Drew talked about fast release is great for lots of this, but it gets softer, all right? You kind of start remembering what you hear about these and then you hear it for yourself and what it does on different types of tracks. And before you know it, you've got a, you've got this kind of mental database of, oh, when I want this sound for a vocal, I'm going to pull up the Vox box, I'm going to go medium fast and fast, and this is kind of getting me, you know, getting me into the right zone for what the kind of control I need for a vocal. Yeah, and you know, to, to to dovetail into that, you know, like a lot of these controls are purposely not marked. I mean, other than you know, mm -hmm. gain, you got to know, you got to know what the dB value is, mic line. Of course, you got to know those filters. You got to know, but otherwise, this is by design. You know, just unmarked, continuously variable controls for you to just you know turn knobs. This is close, this close invites, your eyes and, and yeah. turn right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it invites experimentation. Nice. Um, okay, so let's let's keep let's go through the rest of the tour uh, before we listen, and then so we've got, you know obviously a bypass switch on the compressor. Up here we have a link and separate button. This is uh, this is not active right now because I have a mono instantiation of it, but this is for when you're in stereo. We've talked about this before. The uh, you know the API 
Channel Strip has it, the mm -hmm. SSL has it, where you can, the detection circuits, for the, if, it, if, if it's in stereo, will make sure that the same amount of gain reduction is applied to the left and to the right. Um, and then also over here on the right-hand side, um, so we talked about the signal flow, right? Input first, compressor, the amp, the preamplifier, then the EQ, then the de-esser, and then the very last thing in the chain is the transformer. So that's the actual <laughs> signal flow. It jumps around a little bit, but um, it's so a, a good, a good way to remember side. it, though. It, that actually, that meter control that you showed earlier, it actually uh -huh. it follows the gain stage. So it, there that's, you go. That's an easy, easy. If you ever need a reminder of what's flowing into what, just know that the path that that knob follows is the path that your signal follows. Yeah, that's a great tip. That's a great tip. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. So, so over here we had. Let's talk about the EQ, which is this is uh, you know it's a Pultec style passive EQ, really transparent, very minimal signal mm -hmm. flow. Um, you know, uh, passive capacitors. You know, like you know, it's not a, it's not a big uh, active EQ. Uh, I believe it's modeled after like the the MEQ style Pultex. Yep. Um, with a, with a lot case, more frequency, with a ton more frequency options. Yeah, than with a, a ton more MEQ. frequencies. Yeah. Yeah, and it, so and these are big broad strokes. Like I, you know, if, if you were to scope these and put them on an analyzer, you know, you'll see that these are big broad strokes. That again, that again is, and, and if you look at these these uh, the the slopes, you probably wouldn't do them with a regular EQ. That's what I mm -hmm. love about these kinds of things. I'm just turning knobs and it's doing these big broad strokes. So in my case, you'll see I'm doing quite a bit of 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 this hundred uh, uh, putting in some bottom end. I, I actually. I, this vocal's not that great. It's not super well recorded. I filtered out some here because there were some plosives to try and get them. And then, it, so I'm making this back up on the back end. Uh, no dip. And then I've got some 10K a little bit that I'm putting uh, back in just for a little bit of shine. Nice. And the reason why I'm doing this is because um, it, the de-esser, I'm actually, this is, this is, if we can talk about the de-esser for a second, you know, mm -hmm. we're, what we have here, this is actually really three things in one. Yeah. It is a traditional de-esser. It, you know, when you're talking about 6K, 9K, 12K, but there's this 3K setting, which I'm happen to, that I happen to be using. And excuse me, um, for me, it's like a D harsher, right? That's mm -hmm. what I, this is, and you'll hear this track needs it. Um, and then of course you also have the option of turning this into a limiter. This, is, this, little, this little section here is actually its own uh, optical compressor in and of itself. It's another optical compressor basically inside the unit. And in this case, I've got it to where it's kicking in and grabbing. And of course you can turn the meter to the DS mode to see when it's grabbing. Uh, and I, in my case, I'm using it for that to, uh, to, 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 to de harsh it. But otherwise it's a really nice transparent vocal, uh, uh, DS or rather, you know, 6k pretty typical male one, 9k females and 12k. If you just want to kind of sort of do some high limit sheen, I don't know, Ben, if you have any, any uses you like to use for this. Six, uh, literally what you use it for uh it's you're, you're really you are, we're, we're fully aligned on this one dude uh the 6k 6k is kind of my starter starter if it feels like it's pulling out too much maybe up to the 9k yeah. but yeah a lot of times at 6k and then same thing like acoustic guitars or cymbals or anything where like just overall top end needs a little mellowing out i'll yeah. do exactly what you did bring it down to the 3k um the limit 10 to 1 option on there i've used this plugin a lot I kind of never noticed that was there. Holy crap! <laughs> really? That dude, that's so no, it's, it's actually, a limiter. Yeah, yeah. I, so uh, guys, this yeah. is this is so cool. So uh, and don't sleep on this. I'm not gonna sleep on this anymore because <laughs> now you have a three to one compressor and you have a ten to one limiter. So uh, yeah. instantly, you know, that just instantly clicked with me. Like, oh, so now you can do these kind of like more gentle, a little bit more broad stroke kind of compressions. And then you can have that yeah. 10 to 1 there just to catch peaks, just to catch a little, oh, way too hot, just you know, little moments. Uh, being able to have yep. both of those, one after the other. Uh, I do, a lot of us do this all the time, right? If, anyone, if any of you guys out there are using like LA 2As into 1176s, that, little, that combo, you're essentially getting yep. that combo happening right here. Or 2254, you know, mm -hmm. 2254, separate compress yeah. and limit circuits, or 33609, similar thing. Yeah, it's super, super rad. And then, uh, again, with the EQ, man, like, this is this is just such a great, flexible EQ. Uh, it's got all the things that you want for a vocal, right? 
a little bit yeah, more bottom, yeah. a little bit more meat, a little bit more kind of chest. Get or, rid of the know, boxiness, yeah. Get, get rid, rid of the box, get yeah. rid of the nasal, you know, 700, yep. 1,000, you can get rid of some of the nasal yep. stuff. Uh, and then you've got a peak that you can put in the presence area. You can put it in that, you know, 1.5 to 5K kind of area, or you can go up higher and yeah. grab some air. So, like, you basically, uh, you know, it is, I love the MEQ, I love my Poltex, but the Voxbox EQ, it's like those, but better. <laughs> I'm like, and then, it, yeah, uh, I'm with you hundred percent. It's like, it, it's, yeah, it, it's like, it's, and that was the goal, right? Let's, you know, same with the massive passive. It's like, Hey, let's take all this goodness that we love with passive EQs, but mm-hmm. that have limited feature sets and let's blow them up. You know, let's, uh, yeah. So w- one thing to, just to finish out the little tour here is that this, if there's ever a plugin where you're going to be touching the output knob, this is one of them because mm-hmm. you, there's so much gain available here when you, I mean, I don't have this opened up much at all, but like, there's a lot of gain available through this. Um, and so it's, and to get the coloration right and to get the, you know, to get to gain stage through it very often, you know, you'll find yours. I find myself pulling down the output, um, just because there's so much gain available to the front side. Mm-hmm. Um, Nice. So yeah, uh, well, we got, um, got a good question here, uh, Lama. Sorry, Lama Steve. I saw your question about this a little bit earlier too, but asking about especially when you're using, say, like a Vox box as a Unison preamp. He's wondering, is that before the A to D of the preamp, or vice versa? Uh, and the question, it's it's a it's a complicated thing, right? So the what Unison is doing is it's matching the impedance characteristics of these preamps. So now the the Apollo preamp takes on those mm-hmm. impedance characteristics provides the gain and then that's captured a to d and then it gets processed through the uh, something like the mainly vox box through the dsp version of it so the mic pre takes on the characteristic uh impedance adds the gain converts it to digital then processes through uh something like the vox box or, or any other plugin uh and then that's what ends up getting captured inside of luna so you're committing yeah. to the sound uh, but this processing, it's a hybrid. This is why it's a, it's a really weird, interesting process. It's a hybrid thing of both some stuff before the preamp, the preamp itself, and then some stuff after the preamp in the A to D that then yeah. ultimately gets tracked into your DAW. Yeah. So another another way to put that, or just to restate what what Ben said there, is like what Unison's doing is it grabs a hold of the analog preamp inside of your uh, inside of your Apollo, and it and it uses it as it sees fit to apply the appropriate amount of analog gain in order to get it, you know, a maximum, you know, to optimize it into the, the, the DSP. And then, then therefore the, then the rest of the algorithm takes place there. So I don't know, if, I don't know if that makes any, if that helps at all, but, um, mm-hmm. so in fact, like for example, and you can see this happen, if you take a 1073 and put it in the unison slot and you run the gain up and down, and then you bypass it, you'll see that your Apollo gain has changed as the 1073 has gone up and down, mm-hmm. um, which might be why sometimes it's hard to AB the built-in preamp to a unison preamp because sometimes when you turn off the preamp it the unison preamp has changed the gain of your built-in preamp to for its purposes yeah if that makes sense hopefully that's what it does <laughs> nice <laughs> well so drew let's uh let's, let's show the fo- obviously we've talked about a few a few other you know yeah. we featured this in a few videos before so uh it's nothing if you if you followed along our channel for for a while you've probably seen this pop up in other videos but uh what drew's got pulled up here is, is a great a scenario of like a not super well recorded vocal that you can really kind of bring to life with uh, the compression EQ and gain and, and color that you get from the Vox box. Yeah. All in one side, in one unit, like, uh, you know, hopefully this will translate through YouTube and all that. Cause from, for me in my, in my studio, it's, it's a super transformational thing. Like I, to me, this is exactly what good gear does and good plugins. It's uh, it's transformative and it literally like, it, it just go, it makes it sound more expensive um, and a bit more, I don't know, just more polished. It's just like it's, it sounds like a record in a box. So let's 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 give it a listen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'll start with it on, and uh, and then I'll just play maybe these first couple lines together. You can wreck- So yeah, kind of turned it on and off. I started with it on and then turned it off. Mm -hmm. Um, This time, let's run it one more time. Maybe I'll start with it off and we'll kick it on. We can hear that. So like for me, it's like, man, that like, 
just like the body and the richness. So we've, we've got some saturation, some coloration happening here. I filtered out some of the plosives, but then put it back. And so the body comes up and then, the, and then the sheen sort of comes over the top. I don't know. What are mm -hmm. you guys hearing? Uh, I'm hearing uh, incredibly fair AB drew. What the hell, man? It's perfectly game man. matched. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. I am, I am all about the, fa this stuff. There's no, you don't need to hype this stuff to me. Like my yeah. ear, this just speaks to me as like, sounds like a record. Sounds like a record. Sounds like the gear, you know? And so a proper AB uh, is the way to go in my opinion it, absolutely but, uh people are giving you crap in the in the comments for uh for oh, hitting the wrong, know, hitting the yeah. wrong power I, broke I, your own rule <laughs> i did i saw that i know yeah. i totally uh, deserve that but yeah the, uh, i hear the same it's it's the same it's, it's just like it adds a little bit more power a little bit just it's polished like it, it yeah, really polished. does that's it the does, perfect word it's such a good it goes especially those like first couple of lines when you played it without where you're just like hmm yeah it, just, it just sounds fine it you know it yeah. doesn't it doesn't sound awful but it doesn't sound great yet and then you kick it in you're like you know wow the level didn't change but what feel, it feels better now what happened and that's where to it, me it's like there's two words demo record demo mm -hmm. record that like that you know to, to fall back on those sort of obscure you know they don't mean those words don't always mean to me they mean something sounds like a demo sounds like a record yeah absolutely Man, it's uh, it's a it's it's such a cool plugin. There's some really great, you know. Uh, again, we talked about the preset uh, article that that we had in there, but dude, the the list of presets that are in here too. There's so many of them uh, mm -hmm. from from Joe and Chuck, and I think there's a few yeah, more. I mean, um, is there? I thought, we, yeah, Chuck. I don't know. It was Chuck Zawicki. So sorry, it's just Chuck and Joe that did them. Some? Okay, no. yeah, but they 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 did Yeoman's work there. Look at that. I mean. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, so there's some really, and what's cool about these, they're great starting points. They're great, like, kind of ways to, uh, to the see, get an idea about what you can do with it and then tweak from there. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's another one of those plugins. Like, we've been talking about this over and over again with these channel strips. It's like, it is really, it's really fun to just go in there, grab the controls, add some top end, add some body. Oh, there's a little nasalness. I want to get out of there. Great. 700, mm -hmm. like, uh, it kind of encourages you to think fast, think creatively, um, and then it's got it's kind of just got all the things that you need for a vocal in one place. By the way, Capital Chambers, just a little shout out to Capital Chambers, <laughs> <laughs> doing some heavy lifting on this one too. That, that you know adds so much dimension and depth behind that vocal. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, from the comments here, uh, Jamal saying it's definitely bigger with the Vox Box on. The vocal stands up to the track a lot more with it, and that's yeah. That's what you were saying, right? The demo dem yeah. from a demo to a record, it's like uh, there's a lot going on in the production. So it really you need so you need tools like this to be able to help your tracks kind of speak out and, and be the lead vocal in front of a big powerful track. Yeah, and let me actually I didn't switch to it. Let me just play those first couple lines. I'm gonna switch it over to the DS because I want you to see how much this 3K is getting 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 hit. You can wreck my world, battle my bones. I get up every time. So that that you know that that's just that's pretty that's a fair bit of like digging into that harsher top end which is why i brought out the 10k to mm -hmm. sort of get the sheen back on top so it's like that combination down on the 3k up on the 10k is like is what's making that sort of I, i'm i'm quote unquote dulling it but like i'm putting it back um at a higher frequency to get that sheen happening yeah uh, so, uh, Bjorn's, you know, asking, is this Luna compatible? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, oh, this yeah. is a killer unison plugin. Uh, and it, you know, as we're talking about the mic gain characteristics, it, it brings over all those when you're using it in unison mode. Uh, so you can track through this live. Uh, and it's, you know, again, I'll, I'll shout out the, uh, the video that Greaves and I did together, uh, recording hip hop yeah. vocals. You know, he showed me his way of using the Neve 1073 into a, I think it was LA 2A. And I was like, cool. Uh, that sounds great. Let me show you a, a kind of a, a variation on that idea, which was showing him the Vox Box and how you can get those same sort of sounds, but then you get all these, you know, you get filtering options, you get the EQ, the DSer, um, and in a, you know, this is one of those things that like what Drew, what Drew showing us here, right, where you're kind of digging into the vocal. When you're using this on, as a unison plugin, you're going to be committing your compression, you're going to be committing that EQ, so. Keep that. Be mindful of that, right? Be either listen very intently to make sure that it, it is the sound that you want to live with, that it's the sound that matches the production, or just use a little bit less. You know, the, it's kind yeah. of a yeah. Uh, no one's ever been mad that they 
didn't compress enough on the way in usually. Uh, and that, because if you over compress and you know, if you totally kill it and you attack and release times weren't really gelling with the track, like it's in there. Um, so it's always a thing of like, cool, maybe get it to where it feels really good. And you're like, uh, you know what, just bring that threshold back just a touch so you can do a little bit, a touch less. Yeah, and slower attack times, and then maybe the gain reduction meter is just barely moving on the loudest parts. Like you, you won't regret that. I can I can assure you, gear like this is designed for you to use it, and if if thing if you you know if you use it gently, then you'll never regret it. Like, mm -hmm. and in fact, you'll just be that much closer when it comes time to mix. That's the beauty of tracking through equipment and committing it is that is that you're now. You're not, you're mixing, mixing's easier. Mixing, you know, you're halfway yeah. there already, you know? Exactly. Like the artist could have captured this, this, their vocal through this plugin and it would already it would arrive, uh, yep. pretty well mixed already. And Drew would listen to it and be like, oh, mm -hmm. wow, this kind of already sounds like a record. Yeah. I don't, you know, there's less for me to do. And, the, you know, especially if you're producing, engineering your own stuff, that's where, uh, you know, using tools like these on the way in can, it, it can make your whole process that much easier. And the big thing too is in your singers, especially when they're performing, I can't can't overstate this enough. It makes such a difference to hear your vocal back through something like this. As you're it, when oh, you're in your headphones, yeah. when you're tracking your vocal, hearing it push against a little bit of compression, and like, wow, dude, my voice sounds so smooth today. What'd you do to it, Drew? Like, that's that, <laughs> yeah. You, you you would be shocked how it's basically every session. Whenever I record vocalists with uh, with Unison plugins, they're just like, dude, like this sound. Like, why do I already sound like it's mixed? And I'm like. Because mm -hmm. because I'm mixing it right now, like as we're recording it. Yeah, a lot of high end mix engineers they get a lot of credit, but they're given a, they're given amazing sounding tracks. You know, like mm -hmm. uh, and 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 guess what? You think you're doing them a favor by sending them unprocessed tracks? You're not. Like they want to hear your best attempt at what you think it should sound like, and then they can go from there. I mean, yep. there's nothing worse than getting a, a, a session that has all just raw tracks that you're basically having to re-engineer the session, and and you don't know you don't know where the artist wants to take it if you do your best attempt at it um then at least the mixer has some idea about mm -hmm. where you want to go you know absolutely i see a comment here mr funk Monk saying he's going to compare it with the avalon great suggest like we're, we're making a list of all the different plugins we want to hit uh you guys with through these uh and avalon avalon's on that list so maybe maybe we'll pull that one up uh next because that's a, that's one that's gone under uh underappreciated i think in the yeah. UAD catalog as well yeah for sure. talk about yeah, another sure. super flexible plugin that sounds fantastic well uh guys we're we're hitting the two hour mark here twice as long mm. as as what we <laughs> hope and plan for but it's it's always fun as always hanging out and, and geeking out with you guys uh yeah, it's a fun one yeah super yeah. fun so hopefully you guys uh, enjoy kind of digging into virtual channels the io matrix the vox box uh i see yeah you guys you guys uh there i in think the, the views the views on this one is going to be in the next week is going to be up high it's going to be it's going to keep a lot coming, of rewatching <laughs> a lot of rewatching a lot of <laughs> tips kind of interspersed throughout the way um yeah patrick we're here every week every monday uh so make sure if you guys haven't already subscribed to the youtube channel uh there's a little notification bell if you hit that your phone will buzz every t monday when we go live and also for those special shows coming up on the 11th and the 12th of may uh that you guys are all clearing out your calendars for uh but yeah guys as always great questions in the chat uh really fun hanging out with you all today and showing you some stuff inside of luna and with console and, yeah, and uh, if you missed if we missed any questions in the chat come over to the forum uadforum.com you feel free to post the question there and uh we'll get you the best information we can because sometimes the chat goes so fast you know it's hard it's hard <laughs> to get them all yep absolutely <laughs> and uh yeah send us your music live at uaudio.com tag us in your photos hashtag universal audio and everybody go out there make some music have fun this week stay safe and we'll catch you all next week peace See ya.